Antonov 225. Maria, the biggest plane ever built, needs a runway of a whooping 11,500 feet, which, to put it in perspective, is around 35 school buses one after another. Boeing 737 needs a bit more than 6,000 till the full stop. Cessna 206, a sneaky utility plane that we have a video about on our channel, needs just 1,000. But this plane we review today needs no more than a standard NBA court for a full stop landing, or if you are not a fan of basketball, around one and a half bowling lines. Not a fan of sports? All right, no stress, how about a helipad? Yes, this plane landed on a helipad of Burj Al Arab, which was just 88 feet long. But how was it possible? Let's find out in this video. Welcome to the Big Metal Birds, and today we talk about the planes that define the short takeoff and landing aircraft class, the Piper Cub family. In any day and age, there is a need for a light and sturdy trainer plane. That's what the Taylor brothers thought in the 1930s, coming up with a simple, affordable, and light airplane. Derived from the arrowing Chummy, it had a tubular steel fuselage with a high-mounted wing and an open cockpit, a very simple design. It was originally powered by a 20-horsepower Brownback Tiger Kitten engine. A little-known fact is that since the young offspring of a tiger is called a cub, Taylor's accountant, Gilbert Hadrill, was inspired to name the little airplane the Cub. Little did he know that later on, there would be more than 25,000 different cubs roaring in the skies. But how did the Taylor Cub become the Piper Cub? William T. Piper actually invested in Taylor Aircraft Company, and after the initial manufacturer went bankrupt in the winter of 1930, he bought the assets and began production under his name. The first upgrade to the Taylor Cub brought an overall rounded fuselage, closed cabin, and an innovation of that time. Goodyear airwheel tires, wide, low-pressure aircraft tires that later would evolve into a Tundra tire, setting the standard for bush planes. Also, a 37-horsepower Continental A40 added a bit extra power. In 1939, Europe was on the edge of World War II, and the United States, realizing that they might soon be drawn into the conflict, launched a civilian pilot training program to train future military pilots. Call it luck? or call it a business decision, but the Piper J3 became the primary trainer, with over 75% of pilots trained on them. Why am I calling it a business decision? Well, Piper and the US military really pushed the Cub as a mascot of World War II aviation, a self-proclaimed hero of America in the skies. Even the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt took a flight in a J3 Cub to help promote the training program. Newsreels and newspapers of the era often featured images of wartime leaders, such as Generals Dwight Eisenhower, George Patton, and George Marshall, flying around European battlefields in Piper Cubs. But it wasn't just a Piper marketing thing. A historical study shows that the J-3 and all of its modifications played a truly pivotal role in the World War. What started as a bright yellow trainer was soon dipped in olive green and used extensively for reconnaissance, transporting supplies, artillery spotting duties, and medical evacuation of wounded soldiers. Even when the war was over, 80% of the military pilots received their initial flight training in Cubs. Let's fast forward to the late 1940s, when the J-3 became the PA-11 Cub Special, with a slightly modified fuselage and wings, and a 90-horsepower engine. Well, its short, two-year production life indicated that this model wasn't the upgrade pilots wanted to see. So in 1949, Piper revealed the PA-18 Super Cub, which was much more welcomed, with a production life of more than 30 years. But what was so special about the Super Cub? While the first J-3 Cub and Super Cub share the same structure of the fuselage and almost the same weight, the Super Cub now had 115 horsepower Lycoming O235 and three-step electrical flaps, which allowed it to land just in 300 feet of any sort of more or less flat terrain. Even for the current modern day, it's quite impressive, but Piper didn't stop just there, and later on models with 135 and even 150 horsepower engines were developed. These Cubs, while still requiring 300 feet for landing, could take off in just 200 feet, 
ease of use, combined with lots of power and short takeoff and landing capabilities, has resulted in tens of thousands of cubs roaring in the skies. However, you probably won't find a completely stock cub these days. Much like the de Havilland beaver, by the way, we have a video about it on our channel, cubs were heavily modified to maximize their utility for specific needs. Modifications range from cargo modifications with larger baggage compartments and external luggage pods, to larger fuel tanks and extended main landing gear for better ground clearance. Of course, in addition to the regular gear tires, cubs can be equipped with floats, skis, or tundra tires. Well, with over 10,000 Super Cubs built over 30 years, it definitely earned its legendary status. And as we all know, true legends never die. They are more than alive thanks to various aviation manufacturing companies that keep restoring and upgrading older models. And in the case of the Beaver, it is Kenmore Air, and for the Cub, it's Cub Crafters. They started in 1980, building parts and certified mods for Super Cub, but eventually, and that's another sign of the long life of the Cub family, their own CC-18 Top Cub received the FAA certificate and began production in 2004. What's interesting is that the fuselage merely changed from the original design of 1939. It is essentially the same steel tube fuselage covered with aircraft fabric, with the only difference being the materials themselves become better, thanks to the technological advancements we have today. Top Cub comes with 180 horsepower Lycoming O360. Thanks to this powerful engine, CC-18 can usually climb around 700 feet per minute when fully loaded. And in the case of this plane, fully loaded means carrying the weight of another Top Cub. Yes, the empty weight of the Top Cub is just 1,200 pounds, but the gross weight is 2,300 pounds. Of course, it can change in case you swap wheels to floats or skis, but this is one of the rare cases when gross weight doubles the empty plane weight. In terms of speed, a Cub's normal cruise at 10,000 feet is 120 knots, with maximum cruise being just below 140 knots. But it's not the cruise where it shines. The stall for this plane is just 42 knots with fully extended flaps. The standard fuel tank is 50 gallons, which will give you around 570 miles or 920 kilometers with an approximate fuel flow of 8.5 gallons per hour at 75% power. While the Top Cub was a significant upgrade from the legendary plane from the 1940s, Cub crafters wanted to push its stall capabilities even further. But how could they do that? Well, the math behind it is pretty simple. Make it light, but powerful. Since humanity isn't capable of making carbon fiber engines, Cub crafters were experimenting with the use of composites in the fuselage. Over the years, the Cub became lighter and more powerful, with the CC-19X Cub requiring just 170 feet for takeoff and landing. And just to add, that's at maximum gross weight, which, traditionally for Cubs, is equal to double of empty weight. That being said, slowly but steadily, we rolled to the experimental hangar. Cub Crafters Carbon Cub Ultralight, the plane that landed on a helipad. But how was it possible? Well, while UL Cub is still in development, it was the prototype that did the landing. All we know to date is that the gross weight was reduced to 1300 pounds or 599 kilograms to fit in LSA category. This weight was achieved mostly by swapping Lycoming to Rotax known for its lightweight and reliability. This engine is used in 90% of all ultralight and light sport aircraft. Carbon Cub got the newest 916 IS turbocharged version. Combine 160 horsepower from Rotax, a three-bladed fix prop, and lots of carbon, fabric, and titanium, and you'll have a plane with a stall speed of around 28 miles per hour. A bit faster than an average cyclist on a road bicycle. Of course, it's a statement project, and the plane they used for a Dubai helipad landing is probably even lighter than the official gross weight on paper and probably features zero noise dampening. But again, it's a sports record, and there aren't many specialized sports vehicles, not only planes, that are built with comfort in mind. Thanks a lot for joining us on this journey through time. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did when researching all the facts about this legend. And if you did, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from above the clouds.